If you see this, what's eating you? And I didn't realize, I guess this is actually a TV show. Does anybody watch this? Uh, I think it's about eating disorders or something like that. When, uh, as I was looking for a picture to go along with my title. But we are going to be looking at um, forgiveness. Uh, and put that on the front of the, the bulletin. But I want to tell a story. First of all, this is a little, little bit over 100 years ago, probably before any of us were around. But uh, Thomas Edison had worked, was designing the light bulb. And they had worked and worked and worked, and they finally got it to where they had perfected it. And it took a group of people 24 hours, and they worked 24 hours to actually construct this light bulb. Um, and when it came time, they were getting ready to screw it in, they gave it to this one man to, to take up, or this young man to take up and connect it, or to screw it in there to see how it would work. I was so nervous that he was going to drop it, and that's exactly what he did. He dropped it and broke it. So the group had to go back, and they spent another 24 hours to, to make this light bulb together and to, um, to try it again. And when Thomas Edison looked around to see you know, who was going to get to carry it, he looked right at that young man and said, we do it. And, and he was able to do it, and they, they put it in. So when we look at forgiveness, and I think one of the reasons for me, this was one of those messages that I really wanted to videotape myself at home so I could sit out there and just watch it. Because I know for me, this is so hard to do sometimes. And when I had originally left to go to Boston, I wasn't preaching on this. I had something totally different, and I got it out, and I was starting to study on the, the plane. And this guy besides me, he started talking to me. And uh, he was actually a school board member from uh, Idaho who actually works with FCA and, and things like that. So I just put everything aside, and I got back into the room, and it just wasn't coming together. So, here's where we're at. If you have your Bibles, if you want to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5-11, through 11, we're going to look at these six verses in here and when Paul writes, writes to the church. And if you, uh, I know Steve a lot of times will throw out questions to make you think. I'm going to throw out a little statistic to let you to think about as far as Corinthians. And this is one of five letters that Paul actually wrote to the Corinthians. And if you read chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians 1, there was a letter that he wrote actually before 1 Corinthians. We only have 1 Corinthians, but he talks about this other letter in 1 Corinthians. So you got the one before, you got 1 Corinthians, and then you got one in between 1 and 2 Corinthians that we don't know anything about. This other lost letter. And then most people agree, or most people think, that 2 Corinthians is actually two letters that was just combined into one. Because chapters 1 through 9 is kind of gentle in nature and, and you know and then 10 through 13 is totally different so a um, little history buff there may have been as many as five different letters to the corinthian church but we only know about two of them and we're only going to look at six verses today so second corinthians chapter 2 we're going to look at verses 5 through through 11. starting out in verse 5 it says if anyone has caused grief he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you and to some extent not to put it too severely, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not have with us, for we are unaware of his schemes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that one, that we can use it and apply it to our lives each and every day. Lord, I pray for these, these words, Lord, I pray that you've prepared me um, really to, to help me. But I pray that you use those same words today to also help us as well. I pray for not only Lord, as Paul reached out to his Corinthian church, but Lord, we know that um, you're also reaching out to us today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. A lot of times when we think about forgiveness, we go into Matthew 18 where it talks about how many times we should forgive. And, you know, and a good Jew back then, you know, they said seven times. Jesus said, no, not seven. Seven times 70 or depending on your translation, it's something a little bit different. Basically, there's really no limit on how much we should forgive. Uh, I have trouble counting to 10, let alone 70, trying to keep track of things. 
So I think with that, it's just a, a really, we're not supposed to really keep track. Uh, but sometimes I was thinking that if we just kind of go through the motions and we just kind of casually forgive, we sometimes even for ourselves, we forget what true forgiveness really feels like. And when we look at this section here, and it's, it's debatable, because if, if you go back in 1 Corinthians, there's a story of a guy that was actually, and I'm trying to stay with me here, there was a man that was with his father's wife. I'll say it again. A man that was with his father's wife. This was going on in the church. And Paul talked to him and said, you've got to get rid of that guy. You've got you to point out that sin, and you, they actually kicked this guy out of church. And someone say, wow. But sometimes when we think about discipline, we, I know I talked about that a couple weeks ago, about how hard discipline is. And that's what, what make this passage may be in reference to as far as cause you grief. Um, or there's another talk as far as it questions Paul's apostleship. But as we read this, it really seems like more it's probably this one guy that had been kicked out of the church and now all of a sudden he's trying to get back in or the communication started. Again, and the first thing I think that we can see here, and for us, when we start thinking about forgiveness, the first thing that we've got to look for is one, as far as forgiveness is for the accused sake or the guilty sake, or for those person that actually needs the forgiveness. And I think I can, we can see at least four either people or groups of people that can benefit from forgiveness. And the first thing is just from the one that's involved. Paul says about cause you grieve, not so much as grieve me, um, not to put it too severely, but the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. So he's been punished. This person has been punished. Um, but then Paul says, you know what, there's three things I think that we can see from here that we can learn, even for us today. And the first thing is, just forgive me. And when we forgive somebody, now we're no longer mad at that person. We're no longer angry at that person. We no longer resent that person. And we can move on. But that's the first thing that we've got to be able to do. Paul says that first you've got to forgive and comfort. The second one is to comfort him. I got an email the other day from a guy that used to come to church here. Um, and I opened it up. It was like this long. And um, it was a situation where he was telling, telling me that, you know what, um, he had left the church, came back one time, said it just didn't feel the same. And there was some situation that was kind of a, a surrounding that, that individual and, and his family. And I, and I told him, I responded, I said, you know what? I said, really, you didn't give it enough chance. You just came back one time and that really wasn't, wasn't enough. But then as I thought about that, I think these words here, he was probably right. It wasn't the same because I still hadn't gotten over it. I still hadn't forgiven him for what had happened and I was holding that against him. So when we see here, Paul tells us, that first of all, that we've got to forgive him so that he will not be overwhelmed by this excessive sorrow. And then I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him, to love him. So we see that one, that this, this was a relationship that, that whoever Paul is talking about, there, there was a connection. There was a connection between this guy and the church, this guy and the people of the church, this guy and those people that were there because Paul is saying to reaffirm your love for him. You know what, not just to say it, because if we look at comforting him, bringing him back in, making him feel welcome, a new person comes through the, store, the door. And when we went to the church in Boston, you know, one thing, being a, being a pastor, I was watching to see how are they going to how are they going to welcome us? Anybody going to say anything to us? We were sitting back there all by ourselves. People were just walking by, looking, kept on going. And I thought, all right, this is how it's going to be. But then they had to say hey time. I could see Brian up there telling everybody, welcome your, welcome your neighbors. And a lot of people came around and, and welcomed us. They made us feel, feel apart. Shouldn't have had to do it just to say hey time. Would have been nice to, to come in the beginning. But when we start thinking as far as how, um, how to comfort, some, comfort someone is to welcome them. And to reaffirm our love for them. To be there. Um, so the first one we talk about one as far as how... Into, uh, where it says it's overwhelmed by sorrow. And I want, because some of us are thinking, what about if this person hasn't asked for forgiveness? Do we still have to forgive them? You know, can we kind of just, you know, if they ask for forgiveness, then we can forgive them or we can go on. And I think if we look here, it says here that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. And I think what this is a picture of, one, 
this guy has asked for forgiveness from the church. He has come back. He has tried to be welcoming because the word lupe, I guess, means grief, sorrow, pain of mind, or spirit, affliction. And we know that when we have hurt somebody, we feel that. We talked today in our, in our Sunday school class about sin, and we know that when we sin, we feel it. We, the Holy Spirit convicts us of that sin, and we know that we are wrong. And that's the same way that when we have harmed somebody, we, we've hurt someone, that we deal with this sorrow from our sin or how we have treated somebody else. But I think we should also say, even if that person doesn't ask for forgiveness, I think we should forgive them, and we'll kind of look at that later. But there's two things that can happen out of this excessive sorrow. One, when we feel that sorrow, it draws us closer to Christ. You know what? Maybe we feel alone and we need somebody and there's nobody else there, but we know that Christ is there. So we go to Him, we reach out to Him, and, and He's there to love on us. Or that sorrow makes us feel so ugly and dirty and unworthy that we just draw back in and we've got nothing. So what happens is, if that's somebody in the church, one, that we need to realize that that person needs to be forgiven, they need to be comforted, they need to be loved, they need to be brought back in. That's what Paul's saying. You know what? He's already been punished. Let's move on. Let's make it like it was. Let's make him feel welcome. Let's love on that person. So the first thing is, one, when we look at as far as who we should, um, this forgiveness is for, it's for that guilty one. It's for the one that, that did it. So the first way, we reach out to them. Second thing we look at is forgive for the Lord's sake. If you've ever been in Sunday school, if you ever say Jesus, God, or the Bible, you've got like a 90% chance of getting that question right. If somebody asks it, you say one of those three, you're probably in good shape, you're going to get it right. And I think we can see that from here. Because when he gets past that, as far as reaffirming your love, there in verse 9 it says, The reason I wrote to you to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. In everything. And when we look at Scripture, and I've got a verse here, Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Jesus tells us. It's really not optional. Paul says, you know, he doesn't give us any exclusions here. He says, one, I wanted to see if you're going to be obedient in everything. So when we look at Scripture, we know that God tells us that we need to forgive because He's forgiven us. Even though it's hard, and we know that it's hard. We need to forgive for the, the Lord's sake. The other day I was in a, we had a situation going with the, the, at the school. There was a teacher that had done something and uh, it looked like she was going to get fired. And it was brought before the school board. The administration wanted to fire. The principal wanted to fire. Um, some of our board wanted to fire. And um, I was really struggling with what I, what, how I should vote, what I should do. And... Uh, so I asked the church on that Wednesday night, I said, would you just pray for me? I said, because I'm going there and we're deciding this, this teacher's um, future. She messed up. It wasn't that it was an accident. I mean, she willingly did mess up. It wasn't that it was an accident. She just willingly did that. And Candace prayed. I hadn't told her, but she said that I would be used as an instrument of grace. I went over there and they read. Um, they said, all right, what do you want to do? And there was a little bit of silence. And I said, I say we vote to bring her back. Two other board members went with me. Two, two said no. She came back. We are so quick sometimes to, to jump on someone when they mess up. And we all mess up. Just like Washington, forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's so important that we realize that, one, that the Bible tells us that we are supposed to, to forgive those people. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other in Christ Jesus, just as God forgave you. The Bible tells us that. We know that. Paul says, I want to kind of see, are you going to be obedient in everything? But what happens a lot of times, we kind of pick and choose. We look at those things. This is easy. I'll do that. This is hard. I'm not going to do that. But unfortunately, we don't really get those options. God calls us to be more like Him. One of those ways he calls us, he wants us to forgive for the Lord's sake. And then maybe for us, we need to forgive for the church's sake. We need to forgive. And if you look here and you see, 
this kind of interconnectedness as Paul is talking about down there. Um, we're getting ready to start a new series coming up in actually next week. Brian's going to be preaching on the church. For the next nine weeks, we're going to be looking at different aspects of the church. How it's a community. How it's about discipleship. How it's about worship. How it's about a safe harbor. How it's all these different things. And we see here Paul telling us in verse 10, he says, If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgotten in the sight of Christ for your sake. So you see this connectedness between Paul and these other people. If you forgive them, I'm going to forgive them. Why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? Because a lot of times when somebody hurts someone, all of a sudden we're, we got their back. But instead, when we got their back, we end up causing more trouble. I think one, when we see this church, and we know that when we don't forgive someone, what happens, how it kind of spreads. How all of a sudden, whether you're a teenager, we talk about drama in the teenagers and how what they do. And, um, you know, they could probably tell stories about how so-and-so said this to me. And, and now all of a sudden, you know, we got this person's on their side and this person's on the other person's side. And before you know, we got this huge split. Paul says that we need to forgive. You know what? If you forgive them, I'm going to forgive them. We need to have that kind of attitude. Because what happens with one, when we see it in, in the last part, Satan uses that. Um, he loves to destroy relationships. Whether it's in church, whether it's in homes, whether it's at work, wherever it may be. We just see this importance. J. Vernon McGee says, and I love, J. Vernon McGee is not from Indiana. He's from somewhere down south. When I read this quote, you'll understand why. It says, there are two things that we don't hear very often in our, in our conservative churches. We don't hear folk admitting their sins and asking for forgiveness. Nor do we hear folk forgiving those who confess. There is an unforgiving spirit in many of our churches. We can maybe change that to people. But sadly, that's sometimes the way it is. Church ought to be a place where people can come and be forgiven. How they can be loved. How they can be comforted. How we can get past those mistakes. The last thing when we look at one, we need to realize, actually, Galatians 6 1 says, Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him. And this is out of the message. Saving your critical comments for yourself, you might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. And that really leads us into the last one. We need to just forgive for our sake. I put your sake, but really it's for our sake. Verse 11 says, In order, I have forgiven that in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not have with us, for we are not aware of his schemes. Satan knows what messes us up. He knows the things that we're dealing with. He knows those weak points. And he knows that if he can get trouble between two people, whether it's in a home, whether it's here at church, at work, in the neighborhood, at school, wherever it may be, he could drive that wedge in between them. 1 Peter 5.8 says that be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We talked about this Wednesday night with the students. You know, roaring lion, he can roar, but we know that a lion sneaks around waiting for an opportunity. And I think that's what Satan does with us. He waits when, we, when our guard is down, when he thinks we're at his weakest, and he rises up and attacks us. And when he attacks us, we lash out at those people around us. We need to forgive for our sake because what happens is when we don't, it just eats us and eats and eats. And the person that we're holding that grudge against, a lot of times they don't even know that we're going through it. They've already forgotten about it, moved on, and it's just eating us away. Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And I think a lot of times what we have trouble with, we might say we forgive, but we can't forget. Coolest thing I ever heard about this verse here, the reason he doesn't do from the north and the south, those are distinct points. There's a north pole and there's a south pole. That would be a limit on how far God casts our, our sins away. He said, as far as the north is from the south, really that's not that far. But when he says the east is the west, there's no east pole, west pole. You're always going. It's continually going. It's far, far away. That's what we need to do with those people that have harmed us. Those people that have done things. We need to forget it. We need to cast it. When I counsel couples, 
And I can't remember if I told Richard and Tony this. Um, hopefully I told Amber and Brian, Brian Pope. Anybody else I did weddings in here for? Anyway, when I sit down, I tell them not to get historical. And we talk about how to, how to deal with conflict, how to move through things. And I always want to say hysterical, but it's not to get historical. And the thing about it is, it means not to bring up things in the past. You know, that's why they're in the past. But when we bring those things up, it never makes things better. It just makes things worse. And that's the same thing that we ought to do with the people, or the, not the people, the things that those people have done, leave those in the past, cast it, cast it away. Because when we don't, it's there just as a concept in mind. So I'm going to leave you guys with question one. Who do you need to forgive? Maybe it's somebody here at church. Maybe it's somebody that um, said something to you or, or maybe you said something to somebody. Maybe it's somebody at home. Maybe it's somebody at school. Maybe it's somebody at work. You fill in the blank. But what I want you to do, because when we come here, one of the things we want to focus on is how can you apply this to your life? I wouldn't care if somebody right now got up, took their cell phone out, went out the hallway and called somebody. Instead of waiting, because what happens a lot of times, we say, you know what, I'll wait till I get time later on. That time never comes. Week goes by, weeks go by, month, months go by, sometimes a year, and you're still, still dealing with that. Why not fix it now? Why not do whatever you need to do to tell that person to put it in the past and move forward? Because I think that's what God's calling us to do. To get rid of it because one, that's what He tells us to do. And we know for us that God has forgiven us. He doesn't have limits on what He forgives us for. Thankfully. Why don't we do that for those other people? As we pray, maybe there is somebody here in the church that you've got something that, that you need to work through. Maybe it's a young person. Maybe it's a person my age. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's somebody else. But why not reach out to that person and say, you know what, let's move on. Let's put this aside. Because if we don't, it's just going to get worse. Maybe it's a husband and wife. Maybe you guys had a fight on the way in today. I know how it used to be until Ann and I started driving separate. Sometimes <laughs> tension would rise. We would... <laughs> oh, I get here a lot earlier than Ann does anyway. But that made it easier. I just go when I'm ready. But I know when you're rushing, you know, sometimes we say things that we, we don't mean. It comes out ugly. Uh, maybe you had one of those today. You need to fix it. Or, you know what, maybe you're mad at God. Because as I was thinking about this, a friend of mine came to mind that his father passed away when he was about 10 years old. This guy is probably 42 years old now. Still blames God to this day. Because he prayed, save my dad, don't let him die. And he died. And until this day, he still holds that against him. There are times, even though it's not easy, there's times when we just got to let it go. We've got to trust that God, one, in that case, that if He has those reasons and we have to trust Him. But one, there is so much more out there that if we focus on this past, whether it's a mistake or something like that that somebody did to us, or sometimes it's not even 